Hey, what's up everybody? EJ Hassenfratz here. And in this video, I'm gonna show you how you can create a really nice looking claymation style animation using Grayscale Gorilla Signal and the new clay dough material collection that you'll find in the new GSG Tactile. Let's check it out. So here's my little froggy character that we are going to be claymationifying. Sure, that's a word. And I just wanted to like lay out the scene here. So I have properly UV unwrapped this frog. Uh, you can see that it's pretty low poly, but that's okay because we're going to be using the redshift object tag to tessellate that and smooth everything out at render time. And I'm also going to be using a standard project frame rate of 30 frames per second. And why I'm doing that is because it's way easier to kind of do your animation without having to worry about animating frame by frame for a stop motion-y kind of look. And how we're going to get that stop motion-y look is using Signal to get that very low frame rate stop motion vibe. So just showing you that there's a couple ways you could do this. All right, so to get this claymation look, let's start out with the actual materials, like the clay materials. And that part is the easiest part because what we're gonna be doing is using Clay-Doh. And Clay-Doh, if we open up the plus library here, is the newest addition to Tactile, which includes some of the most beautiful and realistic 3D materials pretty much anywhere. And if you check out all of this Clay-Doh, it is incredible how realistic it looks. You almost wanna like reach out to your monitor and like grab the clay and start molding it and shaping it, make it all squishy. And the reason why these clay dough materials look so dang realistic is they're actually made from high quality captures of actual clay. So there's all these types of great ultra realistic imperfections and details as you can see. And there's a bunch of colors and every color has three different versions. So you can see you know, it's easier to probably see with the screen here, but we have like a little bit of a smoother clay, one that's a little bit roughed up and one that's been really roughed up, really been dented and squeezed with your fingers. And these materials are pretty much drag and drop and they work kind of right out of the box. So I can just drag and drop this green material onto my frog and let's just fire up the Redshift IPR. Let's just minimize the plus library window and you can just see how beautiful that looks from the get-go. Now, if you're using the Redshift IPR, make sure in the options, your scale is at 100%. So I think by default, it's like 50 and this is like 50% resolution. So it's looking kind of blurry and it's hard to make out the details that are in this clay -Doh material. So I'm gonna make sure we have 100% scale, 100% quality, so we can see all of these really nice details. And as the grain starts to clear up, you can really see all of these really nice details, imperfections, little fingerprints on there as well. And this is just looking really, really great. So let's go and double click on this clay -Doh material here and check out what's in the shader graph. So you can see what's already set up here. You have your base color, roughness, and normal textures here. You also have the height, and both the normals and the height are already set up with their respective bump map nodes or displacement nodes, so that's already set up. The great thing about this displacement node is this is remapped to have negative and positive displacement already. By default, this is set to zero. So this means you only have displacement outwards. So this is great that this is just set up with the ability to have that negative displacement as well. So that's really nice. And you're not actually gonna see the displacement happening because of course, to get displacement, we need to add a redshift object tag to get that displacement. So on this object that I have this clay -Doh material applied to, I'll right click, go to render tags, redshift object, and then go to the geometry tab, click on override, click on the tessellation that's gonna subdivide at render time. And to get the most amount of detail from the displacement, and the tessellation, I'm just gonna bring down that minimum edge length to zero. So we're gonna get the most amount of subdivisions and I'll just turn on the displacement. And if you pay attention to the viewport here, you can just see all of that displacement come through and all of those details, those beautiful details really come through as well. Now, one thing I wanna point out is I actually modeled this frog to scale. So when I apply this clay material, it, I actually don't need to do much in terms of scaling the texture up or down because it's like the size of like your hand. So if you modeled this uh, little froggy character out of clay dough, uh, you know, it's about the size of like a vinyl toy or something like that, which means, you know, you really don't even have to adjust the displacement scale if you really don't want to, but maybe you wanted to make this a little more subtle. So you can just bring that displacement scale down and you can see it's a little bit more subtle and that's looking really great in itself. Now we can also apply this material to say the arms here, the foots, the body, the belly I'll have as a different color. 
And let's just see, uh, let's apply that to the lily pad as well. And I'll apply this material to all those objects by right clicking and going to apply. And you can see all of those materials. And again, we're gonna need to add that redshift object tag to all of these other objects to subdivide them and also to add that displacement. So I'll go ahead and let's just go and command click and drag, duplicate this redshift object tag to all of these materials. One easier way to do this is I, let me just delete these tags. Let me apply the tag to the topmost parent object here and I can just right click on this tag and go to copy tag to children. And this will copy that same tag to all of the children object, which is really great. So now we have the redshift object tag applied to all of the other objects. And what this allows us to do is maybe we think uh, you know, the tessellation and the displacement's a little too heavy handed on say the body and the arms. We can go in there and check out these two object tags here, feet and the body maybe, and just bring this displacement scale down to 0.2. So we'll have less strength of that displacement. And that's a little bit more subtle and less heavy handed. Now let's go ahead and command click and drag that redshift object tag to the lily pad so we can tessellate that lily pad and that's looking really nice as well. And we are on our way to uh, making this really cool claymation look here. Now, if we go back into our plus library, you'll see that while there are a lot of great colors that are already here, what if we wanted to create our own clay colors? Well, I'm gonna show you a trick where you can basically create any color of Play-Doh material that you want just using these white materials. And I really like the displaced and distorted one. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm just gonna drag and drop this white material into my material manager. And then I'm just gonna replace the original Clado material, the green one here. So I'm just gonna hold the command or control key down, click and drag, and I'll replace the green material with the white material. And you'll see that update in our IPR here. So same stuff going on. And what we can do now is double click this Clado material. And you'll see that we have this base color texture here. And in the adjust tab, there's this color multiplier area. And basically what this allows you to do is multiply a color on top of the base color texture here. So if we wanted say a more lime green, we can totally choose uh, that color. And you can see that's gonna update. It's gonna multiply this color onto that whitish clado base color texture. And basically now with that multiply color, we can change this color to whatever we want and basically build out all the materials for our scene here. So let's just start with this lime green for the frog, something like that. And instead of having to actually dive into this base color and, and dig into the adjust, we can actually have a separate node that handles this color multiplier. And that node we can add in here is a color absolute. So if I hit shift C to bring up the node commander, I can just type in color and there's color ABS, I'll just hit enter. So basically I can just output this color ABS into this base color, have that adjust that color multiplier. So remember the color multiplier was what we were adjusting anyways. And now you can see that it's now inputting black and that will update in our viewport here. But let's change this back to that like limey green. And there we go. So instead of digging into this base color texture, we can just dig into the color ABS in that input with that color chip is front and center and ready to go. Now, another thing I like to do with this clay material is in real life, clay dough or clay has some sort of subsurface scattering properties. So light being able to penetrate and scatter through uh, some of the surface of that clay. So let's go ahead and add that to our standard material area here. So if I go down to subsurface here, and what I can do is basically I want the subsurface color to be the same color as the base color here. So I'll just go and output this color to the subsurface. And the MS color is basically this color chip right there. And so we'll have that same green color that we have there into the base color input to the subsurface scattering color. And you're not going to see any difference right now because the weight is at zero, which means we have zero percent strength of subsurface scattering. But if I bring this all the way up to one, you'll see that we have this really nice subsurface scattering going on. And this is actually using the old ray trace diffusion method. And it looks okay, but with newer versions of Redshift, there is the random walk mode. 
which is just a much more accurate and beautiful mode of subsurface scattering. And so you can see just how much more realistic that looks now. Uh, but you can see in the fingers and some of the toes is that the light's just scattering completely through it and illuminating it. So what we can do is bring down the scale. So this weight is the overall strength and the scale is how far through your volume, your object volume, light is actually passing through and scattering. So again, I wanna reiterate that I built this model to scale, so it's pretty small. So we can actually go by values of like centimeters and say like, you know, maybe it's half a centimeter we want uh, the light to pass through. Uh, and you can see what that looks like. And I think maybe a value of like 0.3 looks pretty good as well. And at this point, maybe it's a little bit too bright on the fingers there. So we can always go and bring down the weight a little bit to make that a little bit more subtle. And I'm really digging that. So adding the subsurface scattering just adds that extra layer of detail and realism to this clay material. So as I mentioned before, I already unwrapped all of the UVs for this frog character, but what if you don't have a properly UV unwrapped model? Maybe your clay material looks stretched or just too small or too big or something like that. What do you do? Well, when you don't have nicely unwrapped UVs, that's where the magic of triplanar mapping can come in. And if I hit shift C and type in triplanar, see here is my triplanar node. It basically allows you to map a texture along the X, Y, and Z planes of your model and blend those maps together along the angles of your model so you won't have stretch textures or hard seams if you have a poorly UV wrapped model. So let's go ahead and set this all up. So what we're gonna do is basically just plug in our textures to the Redshift Triplanar. So we're gonna input this base color texture into image X. And what that's gonna do is basically with the same image on each axis checked on, it's just gonna, again, apply this image on the X, Y, and Z axes. So that's all set up already for us. And then we can just input that to the base color. And remember this base color is also driving our subsurface scattering colors. We'll remember to plug that in there. And then I'll command click and drag to duplicate that triplanar. And then I'll just plug in the roughness into this. And then we'll do the same thing with the normal. So command click and drag, duplicate that triplanar and just plug that in. And then lastly, we will plug this in to our height and plug that into this placement. And you'll see that the texture just shifted and you'll also see on the top of the model here what is happening with the triplanar mapping. So you can see that we have the this planar mapping on the Y, the X and the Z and it's trying to blend those together and that's that little blurred edge there. And what we wanna do is actually blend that even more because we can see that little seam there. So what we can do to blend these more together is just select all of these triplanar nodes by holding the shift key down. And then you can see this blend amount. Let's crank that up to like 0.6 and let's pay attention to this little area here. And boom, that little blurred edge is blurred even more. And now we have this like seamless triplanar mapped texture looking really good. Now with the triplanar nodes, the scale is a little bit off whack. And I would say the scale is a little bit too big at this point. So what we'd wanna do is adjust the scale of all these triplanar nodes to something a little bit of a smaller value because the smaller the scale number, the bigger the texture and the bigger the scale, the smaller the texture. So if we bring this to say 0 0.025, 0 0.025 and 0 0.025, and actually I forgot to select this one. So let's up the blend amount here. And this is where, you know, you'll have all of this issue because if you forget to select all your triplanar nodes and you adjust them, it could be a huge pain. So the smart way to work, and you can see the texture just got a little bit smaller there, is have one node that controls all of the scale of all of our triplanars. So let's go and set that up really quick. So the node that we're gonna to use to output values to control all of the scale parameters of our triplanar nodes is a constant node. So if I hit Shift C to bring up my node commander and just type in constant, 
select constant and hit enter. You'll see that basically what a constant node does is just output values. Now you can output a real, which is just a single value. So if you want to uniformly scale your textures and have one value drive both X, Y, and Z scale, that real value is going to do that for you. But if you wanted to control the scale in the X, Y, and Z independently, that's where you would choose something like a vector. And we'll actually use this data type later to control a different attribute. But you can see this is outputting three values versus the real, which just outputs the one. And we're actually going to stick with the real because we want to uniformly scale those coordinates of the triplanar scale. So I'm just going to make sure I plug this into each triplanar nodes scale. So constant triplanar scale, and I'll do the rest here really quick. So I have this one constant node driving all four scales of the triplanar nodes. And you'll see because the value is zero, the scale of our texture is actually zero. So that's why you just saw all of our texture kind of go away. So let's input that 0 0.0025 back in there. And you'll see now this single node is controlling all of the scales of all of our triplanars there, which is really, really awesome. So one thing we can do is actually just rename this node to scale. So we know what this is actually doing, what this node is controlling. Now to get that claymation look where it looks like the clay has been touched and distorted every few frames, we can actually achieve that look by simply offsetting the UVs of our triplanar nodes here. So if I go and select all these triplanar nodes again, let's just shrink this down here a little bit and pay attention to the head there. And if I adjust the offset here to like 50, 20, and let's say 80, pay attention to the head there. You're going to see that the UVs just offset and now we are seeing a different offset version of our texture. So if we do this, and offset the UV like every four frames, we're gonna get that really cool stop motion claymation look where it looks like that clay has been touched every frame to distort it and move it. So ultimately we're gonna have a bunch of clay materials for every color that we need to offset the UVs of. So we'll wanna set up a system where we can offset the UVs of all of our triplanar nodes in all of our materials using a single node that control all the offsets of all of our triplanar nodes here. And we can do that by creating a single material and a single node that's only outputting values for the offset. And then what we can do is actually create a reference node that will reference that one material and output the values that drive all of the triplanar offsets in every clay material we have. Okay, now that probably sounded complicated, but once I show you how it's done, it's gonna make sense, okay, trust me. So let's go ahead and let's create a new node. So new standard node material. And you can see this is gonna create a brand new node material that is not the old uh, espresso based material. So let's go ahead, let's convert this clay material to an updated new node material. So let's go ahead and convert our old espresso based shader system with the new node material system. So we can do that by clicking on the material we want to convert, going up to this little menu here, going to material, tools, and convert and replace all materials with nodes. And you'll see that now our old espresso shader based material system is now updated to the new node material system. And this is really good. And so now what we can do, let's go into our node material. Let's rename this UV offset because this is all this material is gonna do is just output values that'll control the UV offsets on all of our triplanars. So I'm gonna delete that standard material node. I'm gonna hit C, not shift C, in this new node editor system to bring up the node commander. And I'm gonna pull up a vector absolute. And this is basically just your constant node from before. And all we're gonna do is output this vector output. So we're going to independently be able to control the UV offset in the X, Y, and the Z. So I'll just output that to the surface. Okay. And that's all we need to do here. I'm going to close out of this node material, open up this node material, which has our clay material, and I'm going to hit C and I'm going to bring up a reference node. Now a reference node will allow you to reference attributes from other materials. So I'm going to go ahead and click on this reference material and it's going to ask you what material do you want to reference information from? And I want to pull that vector absolute values from 
this UV offset material. And you can see right here, that's what we're inputting here. And basically if we connect this surface output to all of our triplanar nodes and have it adjust the offset of each of these, and we go back to our UV offset node and then change this to say 50, 20, and 90, you'll see our material just shifted and all of our UVs just got offset. And we can control multiple materials with this single material and changing this single value. So that is really cool and an ingenious setup. So at this point, let's go ahead and create all the different colors that will make up the rest of this frog character. And I'll get back to you once I go and duplicate this material and apply all of the different colors to this frog character. All right, so here is our little frog scene where I applied all the different colored textures. I also applied all of the redshift object tags to all of the different objects to add that displacement. And I also changed some of the displacement scale values to make say the smaller details like the eyes and the mouth a little bit less displaced. And then I also went into individual materials and pulled back a little bit on the subsurface scattering because it was a little bit heavy handed on, again, some of the smaller objects here, like the fishing pole and that good stuff. So now we have all these multiple materials. Remember they are all using this reference node. So if we go to this UV offset here and adjust these values, this should offset all of the UVs on all of the materials here. So if we just let this update in the viewport here, Boom. So we have one node controlling all of those textures, UV offsets, and this is great. Now we don't want to manually keyframe these UV offsets. What we can do to drive these values and randomize them and also be able to add that stepped motion is we'll be using GSG signal to do all of that random offsetting and the stepped animation. So GSG signal is a plugin that's included in GSG plus that just allows you to add procedural animation without any keyframes. And this is going to be perfect for us to drive the UV offset of our clay materials. So since we're just going to be controlling a material, we can literally put the signal tag literally anywhere. So I'll just apply it to this frog main object here, go to signal. And then what we're going to do is open up this material here go to the vector ABS. And then what we're gonna do is just drag and drop this input and drag it onto that signal tag. And you'll see that this just updated with the letter I, indicating that signal is now gonna be controlling the input values right here on this material. So now what we can do is go into the signal tag. And what we're gonna be doing is using noise to drive these values in the UV offset. So we'll go to add modifiers, we'll go to noise. And then as far as variation goes, we'll have this do a max of 100 for all the X, Y, and Z coordinates here. So that's the maximum variation that you can have on the UV offset. Now, if you look at the feedback, and if I just kind of scrub through the timeline here, you can see those feedback X, Y, Z values are going to be changing constantly. And if I look at my UV offset here, and if we look at these values, you can see those values are constantly changing as well. So perfect. Now to have this movement less fluid and more stepped to create that stepped animation, we can go into the signal tag, go to the output and check on step time. And what this is gonna allow us to do is have this value change every four frames. So we're gonna get that stepped stop motion type of vibe. So now you can see every four frames here, these values will update. If you pay attention to the final output here, every four frames that's just gonna switch to other values. And that's exactly how we can get this stop motion vibe. Now our clay material, everything is looking really great so far, but we can put on one last finishing touch, which is adding a displacer to add extra distortion to the silhouette of our objects and help reinforce that whole clay look. So go ahead and let's grab a displacer here and I'll just place this under the frog body hierarchy for a start. And we'll just set up one displacer and then I'll command click and drag this to the rest of the elements of our scene here. So let's go to our displacer. Let's go to the shading and let's load up a noise. 
Now, the type of noise that's going to look really good with this is a Naki noise. So let's go and grab a Naki. And you can see that the displacement, a little bit heavy handed there. So let's go and let's grab the object tab here. And the height is just way too much. Let's bring this down to like one centimeter. That's a little bit more subtle, maybe 0.5. And I think 0.5 is looking good. Now what we can do with this displacer is have signal drive and input random seed values here to create that stepped displacement as well. So we'll have two layers of this like stop motiony type of distortion going, one from the clay material and one from the displacer. So let's set this up by right clicking on displacer, going to signal plus, and then we'll just go and drag and drop the seed value onto that signal tag, you'll see S which will designate that it's gonna be controlling the seed value here. Now we're gonna do the same thing. Well, we'll go to base, add a noise, and then go to the output, turn on step time, and also put in a value of four for the four frames of step time. So every four frames, the random seed of this displacer is gonna change and we'll get a different type of displacement happening from this displacer. So let's command click and drag this to the head. And you can see that the displacement looks great on the head, but not so great on the eyes. So what we can do is actually have a certain displacer for the head, and then we can actually have individual displacers for the rest of the objects and be a little bit more less heavy handed. So we can probably add a little bit more distortion to the head like so. And since we have the signal tag already applied, we're already going to be randomizing all this, which will be nice. Let's actually bring this down to 0.5 because we don't want the smile to be floating there. It's looking a little better, maybe 0.25. And then I'm just going to command click and drag and duplicate this and bring this to the eyes and we'll make this super low. So 0.1 centimeters for the eyes there and probably do the same thing for the smile and then the cheeks. And that's looking pretty good. And I can't forget the lily pad. So let's apply a displacer to the lily pad and let's see if we can push this a little bit further on the lily pad, have that be 0.5. That's looking pretty good. And let's just apply this darker material to the lily pad as well. And then another thing you can do is again, if that displacement is a little bit too much from the displacer. So let's maybe go back to the eye displacement here. Instead of displacing both inwards and outwards, we can just choose to just displace outwards. So intensity is just gonna displace in one direction. Intensity center is gonna displace inwards and outwards. So that's one way you can be a little less heavy handed on your displacement. And then for say like the head, maybe you don't want this to displace inwards because remember how if we bring this value too high, it's gonna look like our smile is floating. So we can do the same thing where we can just do intensity and this way, it'll only displace outward with a positive value like so, or if you go negative, it'll only displace inwards with that intensity type there. So whatever you wanna do, a lot of art directability here, but now we have a bunch of these displacers and they all have the same noisy driving all of those signal tags. So one thing that you can do that's really cool is we can randomize all the seeds of all the signal tags. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna to go to my little filter area here. And here you can look and select all of the signal plus tags. So I'll right click, select all signal plus tags. And you can see that all of the seeds are exactly the same. So to randomize all of the seeds of all the signal tags, we can hit shift C and then just type in random. And you'll see random seed is right there. I'll hit enter. And you'll see that the seed is now mixed for all of these different tags. And you'll see a different random seed has been applied to all of the different signal tags, which is really awesome. That's very, very handy. And now you can see what this looks like with the displacement running with the signal, changing that noise value every four frames. Super cool. And here it is before the displacement and then after the displacement. So you can see how the displacement just adds that nice extra level of detail and deformation that looks really, really nice. And now as far as creating and rendering that stop motion animation and say, you know, animating the frog character doing its thing, you could go ahead and like I said, animate everything at 30 frames per second, or you could render at say 12 frames per second. And what that will do is it will force you to have to animate on say twos or fours 
and you won't actually need to use the step time feature in Signal, but what that also means is that there is a lot more prep and you'll have to plan out your moves. It has a lot less flexibility to change anything in post because you get exactly the animation you want because what you'll have to do is literally set keyframes on every frame to get the animation you want. So the benefit of animating at 30 frames per second and using Signal is that then you can go in, you don't really have to plan out the moves as much, you have more flexibility in post because you could always stretch out the sequence in After Effects or Premiere using, say, posterized time or something like that. I don't know about you, but I'm super excited to play around more with these claymation style renders just because of how easily GSG Tactiles, Claydo Materials, and Signal allows you to create these beautiful claymation style renders. And I hope this inspires you to go out and give it a crack at your own claymation-y renders as well. That's gonna be it for me. Until next time, go out and make something.